Hi, welcome to Political Perspectives. I'm Cynthia Dickstein, your Political Perspectives host. Today we have a very special presentation for you, a one-hour show on nuclear power. Is it worth the risk? We will define nuclear power for you in lay terms. We'll talk about the pros and the cons and identify alternative sources of energy as well. We are very pleased and fortunate to have with us in the studio today three experts in this field. And I'm happy to welcome Steve Brittle, President, Don't Waste Arizona, a nonprofit environmental organization created for the protection, conservation, and preservation of the human and natural environment in and around Phoenix and the state of Arizona. Also, Jack Cohen Joppa, co editor of The Nuclear Resistor a comprehensive newsletter chronicle of anti-nuclear and anti-war civil disobedience and prisoners' support. And our third guest is Russell Lowe's research director, power plant analysts. Russell's the primary author of a book on the Palo Verde nuclear plant west of Phoenix, which is the largest nuclear plant in the nation. The book is titled Energy Options for the Southwest, Nuclear and Coal Power. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Russell, I'd like to start with you and ask you to define nuclear uh, power for us and talk a little bit about how it works. Well, first off, um, nuclear power is it's an issue that some people don't even remember hardly at this point because it's been, it, it pretty much was dying out. Uh, the government had huge expectations for it. And as far back, uh, well, the last president that really promoted it heavily before Bush was Nixon, who said in 1972, we should build a thousand nuclear plants. One year later, the last order for nuclear plants was placed. And why did that happen? Uh, well, nuclear power uh, is fairly complex. I mean, it, to say it's fairly complex is an understatement. Uh, I'm going to just sidetrack here for a second and say that with coal, nuclear, gas, I mean, go coal, uh, gas, and oil, you have uh, a facility, a plant that burns the fuel and uh, it's fairly simple in a way and except in that you have to capture the heat really well and if there's an accident uh, say like there's a fire or something like that it's it's there are systems to contain that and they do a fairly good job there are very few uh, fatalities or even injuries you know at these facilities but with a nuclear plant you have an incredibly complex system I mean the system is enormously complex really if you if you look into the full range of it and there are 16 steps of the fuel cycle in addition to three steps of the plant cycle the steps are mining you have to mine the plant uh, and originally it's point well then you have to well after milling you have to mining you have to mill the plant uh, you convert the uranium to uh, in its natural state to 100 percent uranium and then you have to convert nuclear and this nuclear fuel to uh, a gaseous state called uranium hexafluoride, and that takes a few steps to do, but it's considered one big step of the nuclear fuel cycle. In that uh, uranium hexafluoride state, that gaseous state, you have to run that through these membranes and enrich it. So there's, that's the fourth step, enrichment. And that brings the percent up to 3.2 percent. Now, all these details, and you're going, well, why should I be concerned with nuclear power? I mean, what, is it, what does it have to do with me? The government now, again, wants to do Nixon's plan and basically build 1,000 nuclear plants all over again. Even though the industry has pretty much died off, it's become a dinosaur. They want to revitalize that. And in order to do that, uh, they want to build, well, with a thousand plants at a thousand megawatts each, which is what they'd like to see, that would be about a five billion or five trillion dollar investment, five billion per plant, roughly. And so you're talking with all the interest and the, the uh, taxes on that, you're talking a huge amount of money that goes into that process. The other steps are going back to those nuclear fuel cycles, fabrication, you put it into the plant, you run the plant, 
you then have to put it in spent fuel pools. Uh, then you have to take care of all the steps of, of the waste cycle. And all of those add up to, s to 16 steps, essentially. And then you have three steps of, of building the plant, operating it, and then disposing of that plant. And the costs are enormous. It will come out to about $18,000 for every individual in the United States over a 30-year period. OK. <laughs> Steve, an MIT study warned that by the year 2050, uh, energy requirements will possibly triple, and global warming is scaring everyone. Um, based on what Russell said, what are the proponents of nuclear power saying? What are their arguments? The nuclear power proponents are saying, among other things, that uh, this can solve our problem with carbon emissions, that uh, nuclear power plants are not large emitters of carbon, of carbon dioxide. Uh, they're also touting that they haven't had a serious accident in 20 years and uh, that the waste can be disposed of properly and safely. Um, and those of us uh, who oppose that can will certainly take issue with all those statements. But they're seeing this as an end. I mean, certainly global warming is a very much of a concern for all of us. Um, and they're using this as an opportunity to, uh, to push their product again. And they have a lot of money behind them. What about the fact that they say that the uh, nuclear reactors, the design has improved immensely uh, over the original ones from 30, 40 years ago? Well, there, there, is, uh, there are 103 nuclear plants in operation in the United States right now, and there are over 80 designs. They never really standardized and they still haven't standardized. They're talking about new nuclear designs all the time. Yet, even the pebble bed reactor design that they're talking about, that's not included in any of the intentions stated by any of the utilities in the United States. They're still going with new, new versions of the light water reactors that we already have. How do you account, then, for the fact that there are some pretty prominent environmentalists who are supporting nuclear power? Well, <laughs> they haven't done their research. <laughs> They're short-sighted. These, these <laughs> prominent ones aren't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. there, there are a lot of different concerns about nuclear power. Um, uh, and and you know, some of the things that I've observed more as a casual observer, I think, illustrate some of them. Um, in Palo Verde, we've had a host of problems that some of them they found you know, more than a decade after the thing was built, they had some very serious design flaws, and they almost had to close it down. And when you have that kind of investment, you wonder if someone has decided that the investment's worth the risk to all the rest of us. And, and I think that's, that's a large underlying issue with nuclear power. You have, a, you have the risk of something catastrophic, but you have other kinds of risks that they never really want to talk about. One of the ones that really jumps out at me, they closed down two nuclear power plants in California. And almost immediately, there was a precipitous drop in the infant mortality rate in a 50-mile radius, because no one likes to talk about it, but nuclear power plants put out radioactive gases that um, you know, can be real harmful to babies and fetuses. Mm -hmm. And they don't like to talk about those things. Um, there's also the issues of, of the transportation of the waste. Uh, some people I know in Kingman had to call me a few years ago. They had had a truck bringing liquid radioactive waste. It was at a Kingman truck stop, and they discovered that the, the radioactive cask was leaking. So it had leaked all the way from the Midwest. And when it stopped at this truck stop, they discovered that it was leaking. Of course, they decontaminated it and sent it back to where it was coming from, not to the original destination in Nevada. 